Okay, so uh, let's get uh, started. And um, today is our, our good pleasure to have uh, Professor Matthew Herm here to talk about uh, uh, research uh, in his group. Uh, uh, professor Matthew Herm is uh, now a social professor in the Department of Computational Mathematics, Science and Engineering, and also the Department of Mathematics, as you can see from uh, the title. And uh, at Michigan State, uh, 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 he's a, a scientific leader of the uh, complex data analysis research team, which develops new tools in uh, computational harmonic analysis, machine learning, data science uh, for the analysis of complex high dimension data. And uh, uh, Professor Horn received uh, his uh, PhD in mathematics from the University of Maryland. And before uh, he uh, arriving at the MSU, he uh, held a, a postdoc appointment in applied math at University and also a Department of the Computer Science at the Eco uh, Normal uh, Superma, uh, Superma uh, Paris. Uh, he's a, a recipient of a Sloan Fellowship, a, a very prestigious one, and the DARPA Young Faculty Awards, a DARPA Director Fellowship, and and that's of a career award. And recently, uh, um, right, and also he he was the uh, 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 design, designated as the uh, Avery Fellow by the National Academy of Science. Okay, uh, 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 Matt, uh, I give you all control, so please. Thanks. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Rangji, for the, the very nice introduction and, and the invitation to give this seminar. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here with all of you this afternoon. Um, so, as you might have noticed, I, I changed the title a bit of my talk. Um, to focus today on, on really on graphs and manifolds, which was part of the original talk, but I really wanted to focus on it today. And some of the work we've been doing in my group uh, on understanding so-called geometric deep learning, uh, which is the design of neural networks for graphs and manifolds via tools in, in signal processing and harmonic analysis on graphs and manifolds. Um, which, which is of great interest in, in the machine learning community at large, um, as well as even uh, folks at RPI, such as Rangji. Um, so, okay. So the sort of premise for this talk is that many data sets of interest um, or the data points within a data set do not have uh, a traditional signal structure, like, like an image, for example, but they do have some kind of structure. And often this non-Euclidean structure can be well modeled by uh, either a graph or in some cases a manifold. So for example, you might be doing computer graphics and working with uh, two-dimensional manifolds, which are encoded on a computer by a mesh, which represents some three-dimensional object like this person here. You might be working in chemistry in which you wanna represent a molecule, as say a graph. You might be working in social science and, and working with social networks. And again, you want to model a social network as a graph. Anyway, there's lots of different types of data that can be well modeled by graphs and manifolds. And even uh, one can take other types of data sets and, and, and sort of try to model them via, via graphs and, or manifolds. And this sort of gets into a, an adjacent field like manifold learning and, and, and such. Anyway. There are many, many types of then supervised learning tasks associated to data of this type, um, including, for example, you might have multiple signals on a fixed graph or manifold, vertex or edge classification, multiple graph manifold classification, vertex alignment between multiple manifolds, link prediction, so on and so forth. We'll come back to some of these examples down the line, so I'm just going to briefly mention them here. Um, and so, the question then that we're going to pose in this talk and uh, give some partial answers to throughout this, this the, over the next uh, hour or so, um, is, is how are you going to take CNNs, that is to say convolutional neural networks, um, which are really, really good at extracting information from signal-based data, such as images in, in this picture here. Um, and how are we going to take them and adapt them to these structured data sets, graphs and manifolds, which have structure but are non-Euclidean, right? And so a ConvNet 
um, as you may be familiar with, is a type of neural network um, which utilizes convolution against filter against the filter bank um, to extract information from image-based or more generally signal-based data. And the use of, of the convolution operation in particular is, is something that is really leveraging the underlying Euclidean structure of this type of image-based or signal-based data. We can do something similar on graphs and manifolds. Manifolds are local Euclidean. Graphs have local structure to them, um, but it's not globally Euclid Euclidean structure, right? And so we want to understand then how can we extend these architectures to this type of data. <clears throat> okay. And so this then gets into the field of, of geometric deep learning. Um, and so geometric deep learning refers to a class of algorithms that attempt to extend convolutional neural networks to graph and manifold data. Um, and they require, amongst other things, a generalized notion of, of convolution to replace the convolution operator in ConfNets. Um, and this, this has spurred a lot of research. Um, there are many open questions associated to this pursuit, uh, including you know, design principles of the associated neural networks on graphs and manifolds, the mathematical properties of these networks, which is something I'm going to focus on here today, um, as well as design principles, though, um, and, and more. And, and so this has spurred a lot of research. There was some, so an overview article a few years ago. There's even more recent overview articles. There's an IPAM program on this. There were several papers since 2014 on this. Anyway, our goal here, um, particularly in the first part of this talk, is we're going to try to build a geometric convolutional neural network that we can master mathematically or at least gain some mathematical insight into it. And yet we still want to capture the expressive power of the state-of-the-art graph neural networks or manifold-based confnets out there in the literature. We want, in other words, our mathematical model to be a good facsimile of what practitioners actually use in practice, but at the same time, we want to be able to say something about these architectures. And then at the end, we'll sort of see how principles from signal processing and such can even be used to design uh, new networks for other types of graphs, such as directed graphs. Mm -hmm. And so indeed, here's, here's the outline for the remainder of my talk. Um, I'm gonna start with some signal processing principles on graphs and manifolds, um, which will include not just the basic notions of, signal, of graph signal processing that you may or may not be familiar with, but also, no, but also notions of equivariance and invariance, which will be important for learning tasks on graphs and manifolds. I'll then describe to you this mathematical model that we've developed for convolutional networks on graphs and on manifolds, which we call the geometric wavelet scattering transform, um, which is inspired by the wavelet scattering transform first introduced by Stefan Mala, which is a mathematical model for traditional convolutional neural networks. And we'll discuss its construction and we'll discuss some of the nice mathematical properties that the geometric version of the wavelet scattering transform has both on graphs and on manifolds. And then at the end, I'd like to discuss some recent work we've been doing on directed graphs and sort of going beyond the standard graph Laplacian uh, to build graph convolutional networks for uh, alternate styles or alternate families of graphs which have some additional structure in them. In this case, directed edges. Okay, so let us begin in earnest then. So in the graph setting, um, we're gonna let G be a connected graph. In the manifold setting, we're gonna let M be a compact, smooth, connected Ramanian manifold. And for parts of this talk, we're actually not really going to care which one we're working on. And so we're gonna let X denote either the graph or the manifold. And indeed, another part of this talk is going to be to try to understand some of the mathematical principles that unify these two frameworks going between the graph and the manifold setting. Regardless of the task, we're going to take the point of view that we're going to need to process a signal F defined on either the vertices of the graph or the manifold. And 
this is very natural in a certain subclass of learning problems. Um, and I'm going to argue now here in the next few minutes that it's actually something that you're probably going to end up doing in almost any of the learning problems that I described a few slides ago. So where it's very natural, of course, is you have a fixed manifold or you have a fixed graph and you have many signals defined on that fixed manifold or graph. Image classification is the classic example. Your graph is the grid. The signal over the, over the graph, in this case, the grid, are the pixel intensities um, at each node, which represents the pixel. But you can do this on other graphs and on other manifolds too. Another natural manifold on which to work would be the sphere potentially. Maybe the sphere represents the earth. We have signals defined over the earth. Maybe they represent weather, weather patterns or something of the like. Here's a more contrived example, but one that nevertheless sort of gets the point home. We've taken the MNIST database and many other folks have done this as well, I should add. And we've stereographically projected it onto the sphere. MNIST is a database of handwritten digits. Now you get handwritten digits projected onto the sphere and you want to classify them. So this will be sort of a little toy example we come back to occasionally. <clears throat> on the other hand, as I mentioned earlier, there's many other supervised or semi-supervised learning problems on graphs and manifolds that are not necessarily obviously signal processing based tasks. For example, you might wanna do multiple graph regression or classification. This is very natural in chemistry in which your database consists of molecules. Each data point is a molecule. So each data point is a graph unto itself. Here's one data point, here's another, here's a third. Maybe you want to predict the energy of the molecule or its drug efficacy or something like that. Maybe some property related to its effectiveness as a drug. So for each graph, we want to associate to it a label. A priori, this isn't a problem in which you're thinking of processing signals over a graph. But the idea is that we're going to generate some surrogate signals that we can define on any graph. For example, the all ones vector, for example, the degree vector, which encodes the degree of each vertex. And we're then going to process these surrogate signals through a graph neural network to extract information about the graph itself and use it to compare to other graphs. <coughs> Excuse me. The same story holds for manifold classification. For example, you might want to classify different manifolds. Each data point is a manifold unto itself. For example, you might want to classify the different poses of people. You might want to classify different people, right? You might want to do vertex classification. Here you have one large graph, in this case, a gene-gene interaction network. Maybe you know some genes in this network are associated to a particular disease, but you don't know the majority of the genes, whether they're associated or not to a particular gene, uh, disease. You want to predict information about the other genes. Are they, are they correlated with, with this particular disease? So this is a vertex classification problem. Again, we'll process a surrogate signal over the graph or maybe some side information about the genes, which we can think of as a signal on the graph um, in order to do, carry out this vertex classification task. <clears throat> and here's yet one more example, vertex alignment and shape correspondence in which you're trying to map this vertex here to its corresponding vertex here, even though this person is, these are maybe two different people and in different poses. And again, we'll maybe want to process surrogate signals. <clears throat> okay. The other ingredient, as I mentioned, is gonna be a notion of equivariance and invariance. And so let me sort of describe that in this slide. So let, let, let's say we have some group element alpha in some group, which then has a group action on either our graph or a manifold X right, which we'll denote by alpha dot x. We can extend this group action to a signal defined on the graph or manifold by defining this action with respect to the signal in sort of the obvious fashion where we say that alpha dot f evaluated at x, x is in the graph or manifold, is f of alpha dot x, okay? So in image processing, you wanna think about here like translations and rotations, right? My group might be the translation group, I might be translating the image, the rotation group, I might be rotating the image, for example. 
we're going to say that a representation of the signal, so U of F, which is just for now, just going to be another signal is equivariant with respect to the group action if it commutes with the group action. So that is to say, if I apply the representation to the signal having been acted upon by the element of the group, that's going to be the same as having the group element act upon the representation of the signal. And so this is going to be a very useful property for our neural networks to have, because it's going with respect to at least certain groups of interest, because it's going to allow us to sort of control the way they behave with respect to these groups of interest. <clears throat> and so in particular, on graphs and manifolds, there's, there's no translations and rotations like in image processing, unless you have very specific graphs or, or manifolds. But there are, there's always isometries. It's a distance preserving transformations, <clears throat> which form a group. And so we're going to build an isometry equivariant network for, for graphs and for manifolds, which in turn then can be used to extract an isometry invariant or even a quasi isometry invariant. So a sort of partially isometrically invariant representation of our geometric data. And we'll see that the choice between full invariance and quasi invariance depends upon the task, right? <clears throat> so for example, if you're doing signal classification on a fixed manifold, you might want quasi invariance. Um, on the other hand, if you're doing graph classification, you're gonna want full invariance because if two graphs are isomorphic, you would like to say that they have the same representation. <clears throat> okay. So that's gonna be one of the key properties we want in our, in our graph neural network or ConfNet on a manifold. Um, another, another key property we're gonna want then is, is also a stability property. We'd like it to be stable in the L2 sense, right? So if we have small perturbations to our data or our graphs or our manifolds, we would like our representation to be stable in the sense that it doesn't change too much. <clears throat> on the other hand, on the other hand, we would also like stronger notions of stability with respect to diffeomorphisms on the manifold or say perturbations on the graph, other types of perturbations. And finally, of course, we also want a representation that is rich enough to distinguish between different data classes. Um, they can distinguish different digits if they're stereographically projected on the sphere. They can distinguish between um, <clears throat> different poses or different types of people uh, or different persons, excuse me. Um, they can distinguish between different types of molecules or different types of social networks and so on and so forth. And so these properties, in fact, are a little bit in tension with one another. Indeed, the first two sort of, to a degree, work in concert. We're trying to collapse information down, remove information with which we want, with respect to the invariances that we wanted, <clears throat> compress information with respect to gaining stability, stability properties. On the other hand, if we want to be able to distinguish between different classes, we better keep a sufficient amount of information in our data set in order to do this as well. Excuse me. Okay. Okay. So <clears throat> I'm going to take a spectral approach to this. I, I do a lot of work in, in spectral theory. Um, and so it's very natural for me to want to sort of appeal to that to generalize the notion of convolution, which is where we're going with this, okay? So we're going to define convolution spectrally using either the normalized graph Laplacian L on graphs or the Laplace Beltrami operator delta on a manifold. So these are the analogs of the standard Laplacian operator for Euclidean supported signals. Again, as we let X denote either the graph or the manifold, I'm gonna let calligraphic L here denote either the negative of the Laplace Beltrami operator or the normalized graph Laplacian. Regardless, whether we're in the graph or the manifold setting, calligraphic L, this Laplacian operator, is gonna have eigenvalues, lambda zero, lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, da, da, da. In the case of a graph, it'll be a finite number of eigenvalues. In the case of a manifold, it'll be countably infinite. We're gonna order them in increasing order 
and lambda zero is always going to be zero. And because everything is connected, lambda one is going to be strictly greater than zero. From the perspective of harmonic analysis in signal processing, these represent the squared magnitude of the frequencies of the graph G or the manifold M. So you can just think of them as proxies for the frequencies of, of the manifold or the graph. And associated to these eigenvalues, we then have eigenvectors, right? So, you know, we, we basically have here L phi K <clears throat> equals lambda K phi K, right? And these eigenvectors, phi zero, phi one, phi two, phi three, these we can think about as the modes or the harmonics or the, or the Fourier modes, right, of the graph or the manifold. And indeed, you can see this in the pictures down here. So here's, here's a graph representing uh, the road network of this. Here is a, an eigenvector of its associated graph Laplacian with a small eigenvalue, which implies it has a small, a low frequency, and you can does it very much over the graph. Here's one with a medium sized eigenvalue, and here's one with a larger eigenvalue. You can see the increase in frequency. It's even more apparent here on, on this manifold of this person, where here we have an eigenvector associated to a small eigenvalue, a medium sized eigenvalue, and a larger eigenvalue. And you can see very clearly the, clearly the increasing frequency of the eigenfunction over the manifold, um, where, say, blue represents negative values and positive values, and green represents zero. <clears throat> so we're going to think of these as basically substitutions, cosines and sines. So in the Euclidean space, we have sines and sines, these are the hikes. On graphs and manifolds, we have the eigenvectors or eigenfunctions of the associated Laplacian operator. <laughs> okay, so here, here are those eigenvectors again. Here are the pictures again on the manifold. We're going to define the Fourier transform of a signal F defined on our graph or manifold as the inner product of that signal with each of these eigenvectors, which is a direct analog of how one would define the Fourier transform on Euclidean space. And in, analog or in analogy with the Fourier transform on Euclidean space, in particular Fourier series, uh, we have a Fourier inversion property, which follows from the fact that these eigenvectors form an orthonormal basis for L2 of X. So in particular, we can rewrite our signal F as the sum of F hat of K against phi K. And you can see here, it's just this. And, and if you think about you know, your standard orthonormal basis property, you see why this holds. Okay, so it'll be useful sometimes for us to think about F in two different ways. One is its standard representation. One is this frequency representation. For a function f and then a filter h, we can then define their convolution. So a filter h, this is maybe the picture you want to have in, the, in sort of the back of your mind. A filter for us is going to be a localized function that's oscillatory over the graph or the manifold. And we're going to use it to extract information from the signal f. And if that signal f is a surrogate signal, we're going to use it to then extract information from the graph or manifold itself. We're going to do this with a generalized notion of convolution that we define in frequency inspired by the Fourier convolution theorem, which states that uh, convolution in space and traditional Euclidean space and frequency is represented by pointwise multiplication. So standard convolution in Euclidean space involves the notion of a translation. Again, there are no translations here because we're working on a graph or a manifold or at least no global notion of a translation. So instead we just define convolution directly in frequency as the pointwise multiplication of the Fourier transform of F and the Fourier transform of H. And then if we wanna get back our space, our space representation of that convolution on the graph or the manifold, we then multiply these against the Fourier modes or the eigenvectors VK and we add them up. You can also think about this as a local aggregation step of the signal F centered at the point X, which is sort of exactly what this filter is sort of meant to show here in this picture, right? So your point X here, right, is right here, and you're then aggregating information in a neighborhood of X according to the size of the filter, which really is through this kernel. And the kernel here is of this type. And um, anyway, you can see um, the filters diagonalized by the eigenvectors. That's sort of the point of this. Okay. Okay, so now we have a notion of 
uh, the Fourier transform on graphs of manifolds, we have a notion of convolution. Now we can get to defining what types of filters we actually want to use. And for the geometric wavelet scattering transform that I mentioned at the beginning, we're going to use wavelet style filters on graphs and manifolds. And so let me describe that to you. And a key thing here is we want to make sure that these filters are equivariant with respect to isometric transformations of our data. Okay, so we're going to build these equivariant wavelet filters on graphs and manifolds as follows. We're going to say we're going to take some function g which can take in any eigenvalue. Remember, our eigenvalues live in zero to infinity. And it's gonna map any eigenvalue of our graph or manifold to the interval zero, one, in such a way that G of zero equals one. And then G of lambda is going to be strictly less than one for any lambda greater than zero, but at least, at least not negative, okay? So you can think about G as really being sort of like a smooth, decreasing function, something like this, okay? Where here is lambda and here is g of lambda, okay? And in wavelet theory, you have a low-pass filter and you have a mother wavelet. So our low-pass filter, which is, is gonna be this phi hat j k, which we're gonna define as g j evaluated at lambda k. In other words, g, which we're gonna say is g two to the j, all right? So you have to remember then also, so I can write this maybe for the low pass filter somewhere. So then when we convolve with it, right, we're going to have then that our signal F convolved with say a low pass filter at X will be then the sum over K greater than or equal to zero F hat K phi J hat K phi K X. So to define these filters, we just need to define their Fourier transforms. And that's what we're doing here in this slide. Okay, so this says basically that phi j is going to look like this. It's going to capture the low frequencies of our graph or manifold. And, you know, g is this, is this you know, function defined on the continuum of lambda. But then when we evaluate it at the eigenvalues, it's, it's basically evaluating at this irregularly spaced grid, right? Corresponding to the low eigenvalues or the low frequencies of the graph or manifold. To get the higher frequencies, that is to say the larger eigenvalues, we're gonna construct wavelet filters where in frequency, they're the difference between the low pass at consecutive dyadic scales. And so that's gonna create in frequency then, that is to say on the eigenvalues, these multi-scale or multi-resolution supports where each wavelet is going to capture progressively higher frequencies and larger bands of frequencies. And the way these filters are going to look at low pass and the lower frequency wavelets are larger supports on the manifold, which you can see here on these right, rightmost images. And these higher frequency wavelets are going to have much smaller supports. Our wavelet transform is going to compute the convolution of a signal against the low pass in all our wavelets. And this has some very nice properties associated to it, in particular because we define them in terms of this universal G function, which is going to allow us to have several properties, including the following. One is gonna be equivariance with respect to isometries. That is to say this wavelet transform will commute with the, isomet with the operation of any isometry on the graph or manifold, okay? So V zeta here, is the extension of the, is the isometry group action on X to F, as we discussed before. It's energy preserving, in other words, it preserves the norm of the signal. Um, and, it, and it's also invertible, which I don't have written here mathematically, but it's also invertible. You can see what these wavelets look like in these pictures over here. Um, again, we have some larger ones on the right, some smaller ones on the left. These are higher frequencies on the left lower frequencies on the right. But, and you can see here, so here it's the same person in the first two rows, but the wavelet is centered at different locations, one in the head, one in the foot. You can see how it's sort of the same general filter shape, but it adapts to the local geometry of the manifold at which, of the point at which it's centered in the manifold. And then going to the third row, it's now a different person 
but centered in the foot at the same location as the second row. And so again, you can see how the filter has the same general shape from person to person, but again, adapts itself in the details are a little bit different as it adapts itself to the local geometry of each individual person. And so this is going to allow us to define these networks over a, you know, a, a database of many manifolds or many graphs, but make, be able to make comparisons between them in the case of graph or manifold classification problems. Um, on the other hand, the fact that the filters move over a manifold nicely in a nice fashion will allow us to also do other problems which are specific to say one manifold like vertex classification on a graph say, um, or things of that nature. Okay, so we have this bank of filters that will pass in different wavelets. And now we're gonna, and, and now we're in their equivariant, which is really nice. And now we're going to use them to build uh, a neural network on graphs and manifolds, which we're gonna call this geometric wavelet scattering transform. And so this picture is gonna summarize the whole thing. So the idea again is for the wavelet transform here, which is WJ, right? Is we take in a signal F, say like a digit five stereographically projected onto the sphere. And we compute its wavelet coefficients, right? These are the wavelet, the, the, the band pass wavelets. Here's the low pass. We're gonna keep the low pass. We're gonna store that away. Why? Because we said that all of these are equivariant with respect to isometries, but it turns out that the low pass is in fact also quasi invariant because it's only keeping the, the low frequencies of the graph or manifold. And it turns out that the low frequencies of the graph or manifold satisfy a certain type of quasi isometric invariance property when you define your wavelet filters with this G function that we described on the previous slide, this function of the eigenvalue, not of the index of the eigenvector. The wavelet coefficients though, they're equivariants, but they're not, there's no type of quasi invariance associated to them. As you remember from the previous slide, they live in the, the larger eigenvalues of the graph, the higher frequencies. The invariance ones are down in the low eigenvalues or the low frequencies. We want to take this high frequency information and push it down to the low frequencies. We're gonna do that with a nonlinear transformation, in this case, a modulus, but you could also pick a ReLU, or in this case, an absolute value, but you could also pick, for example, a rectified linear units, even a sigmoidal function. Some function that takes this signal, which is oscillatory over the graph or manifold, and turns it into a non-negative signal. This is gonna have the effect of pushing some of the signal, the frequency content of these wavelet coefficients down to the low frequencies. We're then going to apply a second wavelet transform to these nonlinearly transformed wavelet coefficients, which is going to give us second order wavelet coefficients. So wavelet coefficients with a scale J1, followed by an absolute value, followed by a second wavelet scale J2, as well as the low passes of the nonlinearly transformed wavelet coefficients from here. And these, like these coefficients here, as represented by these images here, are going to be not only equivariant with respect to isometries, but also quasi-invariant. <clears throat> and furthermore, they allow us to capture some information in the original signal F that these coefficients did not, because these only captured the low frequencies of F. These captured all the other high frequencies. Now we can recapture some of the high frequency information that was in these wavelet coefficients with these nonlinear, nonlinearly transformed wavelet coefficients followed by a low pass. But it's not everything, right? It's not everything. We still have some information left here. And then we sort of iterate upon the logic, right? We say, well, these live in the high frequencies again because they're followed by a wavelet. So let's apply another nonlinear transform, another absolute value, apply another wavelet transform and extract the low frequency parts of that, which is represented by these images here. And so on and so forth. And again, one can argue that, well, we haven't quite captured everything and we can continue on. Okay, but the, the, the idea is that we've now formed a type of geometric convolutional network defined on graphs and manifolds because all these convolutions are defined with respect to the spectrum 
and the eigenvectors of the graph of the manifold. But in which at each layer we're extracting low frequency components of nonlinearly transformed high frequency components. And so what I'm going to show you next are some theory that describes the invariance and stability properties of these. And then some numerics, which illustrate that indeed they are capturing a fair amount of information in the original signal F, which again might be a proxy for the manifold, although not in this particular design here where the signal is, is of interest to itself. Okay, so here's, here's, the, here's the geometric wavelet scattering transform written out just in terms of formula. Again, it's, it has the style of a convnet though, right? Because we have a generalized convolution followed by a nonlinearity, followed by a convolution. You know, you know, in the case of these coefficients, convolution, nonlinearity, convolution, nonlinearity, convolution. And we can go deeper, right? So it has this sort of style of a convnet. There are some key differences, which I'd like to highlight, which is in particular, the use of wavelet filters, which are multi-scale. Um, in contrast to many graph neural network filters, which are highly localized. Um, the use of bandpass wavelet filters is also sort of a bit different than most graph neural networks. But anyway, um, so it's on the one hand, a model for graph neural networks and neural networks on manifolds. On the other hand, it has some of its own uh, flavors to it as well, which are distinct. Okay, so here's one property, L2 stability. You have two signals defined in L2 of X graph or manifold, you compute the M layer geometric wavelet scattering transform. So M is the number of layers. J here, as we'll see, will control the amount of invariance. It's the size of your low pass filter over the graph or manifold. For any M or J though, it doesn't matter. Um, the L2 difference between your uh, M layer scattering representation of signal one and signal two is gonna be no more than the L2 difference of, this for, of the signal one and signal two. Okay, so it has that L2 stability property that we desire in particular. One might want to think of F2 as a small L2 perturbation of F1. This says that the representation cannot be too different between the two. Let's do something a little bit harder now. This basically follows from the fact that the wavelet transform is an isometry. Let's do something a little bit harder now. Let's consider isometry, right? That was the group that we said we want to be equivariant or invariant with respect to actually. So let zeta be in the isometry group of a manifold. So now I'm gonna do specifically manifold things. That L2 stability was graphs or manifolds. Now I'm gonna do specifically manifolds, then we'll do specifically graphs. Suppose our low pass has uh, an exponential decay in the eigenvalue, right? So that's, that's a very standard type of, of low pass function, even in Euclidean space. Then let's compare the scattering representation. So our, 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 our manifold convnet representation of the signal F and compare it to the scattering representation of the isometrically transformed version of F, right? This theorem shows they're not, they're going to differ by a factor, which depends on two things. One, the size of the isometry and two, the size of the low pass filter. The bigger J, the bigger, uh, the bigger the low pass rate. So larger J, larger phi j. In other words, phi j, which you can think of as like a local averaging operator over the manifold of the graph, as I let j get bigger and bigger, it becomes like a global averaging operator over the manifold or graph. And indeed, if I were to let j go to infinity, I would get full invariance, which makes a lot of sense because if I compute like an integral summation over my graph, then it's going to be invariant to isometries, whatever representation I have, because I, um, the change of variables in, 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 for isometry is not going to be. Um, okay, so this is great. So this is either quasi-isometric invariance when we want it for maybe like signal classification, or full invariance when we need it for say graph classification. Let's do something even a little bit harder. Let's now consider um, diffeomorphisms. Um, now let zeta be in the diffeomorphism group of M. Again, suppose our low pass and frequency has exponential decay. And let's decompose our diffeomorphism in terms of two other transformations. One, zeta one, which is an isometry, and two, zeta two, which is yet another diffeomorphism. In fact, you could, you can, 
any any decomposition like this will work and that's sort of going to give us a bit more power which i'll explain in a second then if our signal f is band limited meaning that its fourier transform is zero beyond a certain eigenvalue then if we compare the scattering representation of f to the scattering representation now of the deformed version of f which is more general than an isometric transformation we see that it's going to be bounded in terms of two quantities one is the same invariant quasi invariance term we had on the previous slide for the isometric component of zeta the other is the stability property in terms of the size of zeta 2 which is the diffeomorphic component of zeta and in can say minimize one can look over all decompositions of zeta in terms of zeta one and zeta two where zeta one is an isometry zeta two is a diffeomorphism and pick the decomposition such that zeta two minimizes this quantity right then in terms of the invariance you can always control it right you can always control it because you can always pick your j to to reduce this term as needed or even kill it but you'll then obtain the strongest type of stability uh, possible for this, for whatever diffeomorphism you have, subject to the constraint of having the band limited function up. So anyway, this is all to say that these networks have enjoy both controllable invariance properties, as well as a type of Lipschitz stability with respect to diffeomorphisms. And the invariance again is with respect to isometries. Here is some numerical yeah. work on manifolds. Um, Sorry, may I ask you a quick question? Oh yeah, of course, please. Yeah, I mean, all your theorem, because as you mentioned, there's a filter G, right? So all the theorem does not depend on the choice of the filter? No, it does, it's right here. Because oh, um, phi hat of K is G of lambda K. Okay, so you have some decay, it's like exponential decay, okay, okay. Yeah, I'm basically saying, pick G to be, you know, the exponential function. Yeah. yeah. The, the good, other good question, question is, uh, the other question is, this is like, a, I mean, in a conventional neural network language, this is like a sort of the, the forward. There's, there, is there any training uh, going on here or you don't do any training? There's no training here. Um, let me, I'll describe, the numerics have no training except for an SVM at the back end. Okay. Good graphs if I could get to it. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So these are, this is a hand design network. I mean, yeah. you could train it in the sense that you could parameterize G and train G, right? Yeah. That would certainly be an option. And there are some other options that we've been working on and that other folks have been working on and, and, and such. But for what I'm going to show today, it's, we've, we just picked be this, in fact, E to the minus N. Okay. I see. Um, and so for these types of results that what we do is we, so for example, here's the digit classification of this, right? We process the geometric scattering transform of these digits and then we feed it into an SVM. So the training is in the SVM, or yes, digitally, somewhere or not. We say build an SVM on top of the geometric scattering transform. And then we compare to say other fully learned networks, right? Which learn all the different filters and all the different layers of the network. Um, and the results are pretty comparable. And indeed, these were even designed for the sphere, which ours was not. So we thought that was pretty nice. This is when you don't rotate the digits. This is when you random after the stereographic projection. This is when you randomly rotate them after the stereographic projection. Ours has invariance, the quasi invariance built in. So it's completely unaffected, for example, by that, which is why the two results are the same. Here it's um, using a different data set called Faust, which consists of um, 100 different um manifolds of 10 different poses um, a lot of folks use this for vertex alignment problems which are really interesting we used it for something else which is to just classify the manifolds themselves in terms of either the person uh, which is the row or the pose column right and again you have some which are labeled some which are not labeled um, and, and we had some surrogate signals in this case which are called shot features which have been developed by uh, these folks here and um and when we process just the shot features alone we get for pose classification 92 percent accuracy and for person classification 61 percent when we then do the geometric scattering transform on top of the shot feature signals followed again by an svm and actually in both cases 
We improve the accuracy from pose from 92 to 95. Okay, that's a small increase, but for person, we go from 61 to 81, which was a more significant um, increase. Okay, so that's all to say these things are also extracting a fair amount of information from this type of data. In the graph setting, there's some analogous theory. Um, we have to change the wavelets a little bit. You may recall using the normalized graph Laplacian, not the regular graph Laplacian. So let D be the diagonal matrix, which has the degrees of each vertex on its diagonal. And we're gonna replace the, the convolution F with H, which in this case is just a matrix against a vector, right? TH is just a matrix, F is just a vector. And we're gonna do this for either the low pass or the wavelets with D inverse half TH D half, okay? Otherwise, we're gonna do everything the same as you see up here in the diagram. Let's again talk about invariance, right? So invariance in this case is gonna be with respect to permutations of the graph, which means you, you write down the vertices and edges in some way, I write them down in another way. They're still the same graph, right? So we'd like some control over the representation with respect to how we write the graphs down on the computer, right? Okay, so let G be the graph, let G prime be the permuted graph. Um, let S J let, let S of G be the scattering transform on the graph. Let S J G prime be on the, the scattering of the permuted graph. And then again, for any signal F, right, we can compare the scattering of G against the test vector F and compare it to the scattering of G prime against the permuted F. Because if you permute the vertices, the F will permute with it. We're assuming F is somehow intrinsically defined in terms of the vertices. And you can control it. Again, you can control it in terms of, again, two factors, one which is sort of the size by which the permutation differs from the identity, and the other is this g, right, the same g function of lambda one, right, which was the first non-zero eigenvalue of g to the two to the j power. And I remind you that g of lambda one is strictly less than one. And so again, if you want full invariance between how you write the graph down and how I write the graph down, which you certainly wouldn't say graph classification, you can let J go to infinity. And it's again like computing a summation over all the vertices of the graph. And of course it makes sense that you'd be fully invariant. But if you want some sort of more subtle notion of invariance or quasi invariance, which you might want, for example, in vertex alignment problems, you can control it with this J. And then again, similarly to manifolds, let's look at like a little, let's look at a bit harder problem which is stability. So now we're gonna let G and G tilde be two graphs, one not necessarily a permutation of the other, both with the same number of vertices. And we're gonna again let S, G and S, G tilde be the geometric scattering transforms of G and G tilde respectively. We're gonna let T of G and T of G tilde be the low pass operators of them, okay. Um, and again, we're gonna have, we're gonna say F is on L2 of G, and because G tilde has the same number of vertices, we can port F over to G tilde just in whatever fashion we like. Just define it on G tilde through some fixed ordering of the vertices of G and G tilde. So we're really just thinking of this like as a test vector now. So we're gonna compare the scattering of G against the test vector F to the scattering of G tilde against the test vector F. This is, we really want to see like, are these gonna be close in terms of some notion of perturbations between the graphs? With, and then also some invariance. And indeed we have again, two terms like in the manifold case, an invariance term, which is the same one we saw on the previous slide. So in particular, well, sorry, let me continue. And a stability term, which I'm gonna argue this is a stability term, which is basically uh, a type of operator norm between the, just the low passes of the two graphs, right? So if, if G tilde is G prime, then this term will be zero. And this term, we can make, um, we can make, in fact, because also the other key thing here is the minimization over all permutations pi, right? So this is really controlling a lot now. Um, in fact, this we could then say, well, like, however you permute G prime to get back to G, we can then control that again with this. On the other hand, again, since this is controllable, you can pick the permutation that best aligns G and G tilde get a strong stability property, not unlike in the manifold case. And then again, you can control this. Anyway, the key, the key is again, you have an invariance term and a stability term, which has now been adapted to the graph setting. 
um, and allow you to sort of know that you have a representation that sort of controls these things in a way, uh, in, in a nice way. Um, here's some numerical results again. These are now two years old, but we again, unlearned graph scattering transform on different graphs, uh, social network style graphs. Uh, we want to do graph classification in this case. So we're letting J go to infinity, for example, right? Com com computing sums over vertices, followed by an SVM classifier. At the time, our results were competitive with the state of the art, even though these were fully learned graph neural networks or graph kernels versus ours, which was an unlearned graph scattering transform followed by an SVM. But again, there are some key differences, such as the multi-scale nature of the wavelet filters, which really helped things out for us. Um, here, more recently, we did some graph regression on molecular graphs for the prediction of the log of the partition coefficient, which is P of the molecule, which is, um, anyway, a proxy for the efficacy of, or uh, what's something you need to know for, in order to determine the efficacy of the molecule for, uh, to be a drug. And yeah, this performed really well. Actually, one of the best method in this particular uh, comparison. And here, what we did was we didn't follow with an SVM, but we followed with a neural network, some fully connected layers of a neural network at the back end, which were learned, of course. And we can see that the combination of the graph scattering or geometric scattering plus the neural network leads to a very nice embedding of these molecules according to their partition coefficient, which is indicated here by the color, which explains to some extent the good performance. Um, am I out of time or do I have like five more minutes? Is it going till 4.50 or till five? Yeah, you can have a five more minutes, don't worry. Okay, okay. So let me just then spend five minutes talking about directed graphs. Um, in the directed graph case, right, so now you have edges which have a directionality to them, right? Just because a vertex A points to vertex B doesn't mean vertex B points back to vertex A, right? Um, and so from the spectral perspective, this is a problem because now your graph Laplacian is not symmetric. Hence, we're not guaranteed a full set of real eigenvalues. On the other hand, maybe I do a spatial graph neural network, which is say based upon vertex neighborhoods. My filters are based upon vertex neighborhoods. These are often easily adaptable to the directed graph setting, but it's sort of like you have to either turn it on or off in the sense that you have to just work on the directed graph and live with the directed edge weights of your spatial graph neural network, or you symmetrize all the edges and you just turn the directionality off completely and there's sort of no in between. Um, and so it's hard then for them to balance between directed information in the graph and then structural patterns that are independent of direction, which you can kind of see here, right? So like there's, a, there's some structural stuff here in this graph, which you would see from this visualization, irrespective of whether the edges are directed or not. And then of course, there's the, the directionality of the edges, right? Are they all pointing out mostly? Or are they all pointing in mostly things like that? So it turns out that in learning tasks, it's sometimes useful to balance these two considerations. Anyway, people have thought about this in different ways, but um, not, to the best of my knowledge, not the way which I'm about to describe, which is um, rather than using the graph Laplacian, we're gonna use a complex Hermitian matrix to encode the directed graph. And I should say, this unto itself is not new. Many people have thought about what I'm writing on this slide, but not in the context of graph neural networks. Um, the idea is that the magnitude of the entries of this complex Hermitian matrix will encode the presence of an edge. And the phase, the complex phase, will encode the directionality. Um, and we can, and, and this leads to the so-called magnetic graph Laplacian, which has been in the literature now for several decades, and which I describe here in these next few bullet points. But basically, we let A be the adjacency matrix of a directed graph, and we symmetrize it. So this is going to encode the presence of an edge, but not its direction. And then to encode direction, we define this phase matrix as AXY minus AYX, right? Um, again, this is not symmetric because it's directed. And so then the magnetic graph Laplacian is sort of like the regular graph Laplacian. We take the degree matrix, in this case of the symmetrized adjacency matrix, and then we want to subtract off the adjacency matrix here, the symmetrized one, but we add in this Hadamard product, right, which is an entry-wise multiplication with the phase or the E to the phase, right? E to the I of the phase. And this then allows us to encode simultaneously 
the presence of an edge as well as its directionality. In particular, if you were to set this Q parameter to say be a quarter, then uh, if you had a bi-directional edge, so an undirected edge, then um, this quantity here would be one. If you had an edge pointing in from say U to V, then, or from X to Y, excuse me, then this quantity would be like the imaginary unit. And if it was pointing from Y to X, it would be the negative of the imaginary unit. So it's basically encoding, yeah, um, exactly what I said, the presence of an edge through its magnitude and the directionality through its phase. And so <clears throat> it, because it's complex Hermitian, it enjoys a lot of nice properties from the spectral theory perspective, in, per, in particular, a full set of real eigenvalues, complex valued eigenvectors, but which still form an orthonormal basis, and this parameter Q allows us to tune the balance between structured patterns in the graph or undirected patterns and directional information, which can be very useful in semi-supervised learning tasks. And the punchline is that you can take your favorite spectral graph neural network and turn it into a directed graph neural network using this magnetic graph Laplacian, so long as you're willing to use complex value matrices. And that's exactly what I did. Since I'm running out of time, I'm going to skip this. But basically, we took Chebnet, if you're familiar with Chebnet, and we built a new one based on the magnetic graph Laplacian for directed graphs, which we call Magnet. And otherwise, it follows a lot of the same structural sort of design choices, including you know the, the, the use of uh, spectral convolution with polynomial filters and frequency. Um, we replaced ReLU with a complex-valued ReLU, right? So what's going on there, right? If you have the complex plane here, right, then your uh, your complex ReLU keeps Z on the right half and turns it to zero on the left half, sort of like a real valued ReLU, but now extended to the complex plane. And then at the end of this, right, after the convolution layers, we just unwind the real and imaginary parts and we feed them through a fully connected layer, which is adapted to the task, be it vertex classification, link prediction, graph classification, and so on. Hey, this works really well. Um, we don't have a lot of theory associated to it. The theory of the magnetic Laplacian and complex valued Hermitian matrix representations of directed graphs is an active and ongoing field research unto itself, not nearly as fleshed out as traditional spectral graph theory. It actually makes machine learning work in this case because uh, the algorithm can learn what it needs to learn to carry out the task without us having to necessarily fully understand it all, though we'd certainly like to. Anyway, here, you can see it's overall performing quite well. Bold means number one, um, underline means number two. So on all but one data set, we're either number one or number two. Um, Cornell, Texas, Wisconsin, our website network. So can link to you, but you don't have to link back to it. Core ML and Cites here are citation networks. You can cite a paper, but that paper doesn't have to cite you or vice versa, right? So these are fundamentally directed. These synthetic ones are designed to basically break symmetrization methods. They have a, they're based on modified stochastic block models in which you can see the clusters or the blocks very clearly when you look at the directed adjacency matrix, but when you symmetrize it, it completely gets washed out. Anyway. Um, You'll notice that for some tasks, the Q parameter that's learned is zero, like in citation networks where you're trying to predict the field of the paper. <coughs> Most papers in the field will cite other papers in the field. It's really not a directed task. You can see this reflected in the Q that's selected. On the other hand, for these other ones, in particular, these synthetic ones, you can see directional information is really important because it picks a larger Q. Here it's for link prediction. Again, the performance is good. I'll just point out that for the citation networks, now the queue is very large because if I cite you, that's completely different than if you cite me. And so now the directionality is really important and it learns that. Okay, I conclude because I'm out of time. Tools from graph and manifold signal processing and spectral theory um, provide avenues by which to analyze um, existing graph neural network architectures and also a developed new one, say, for directed graphs. Uh, the geometric wavelet scattering transform, on the one hand, provides a mathematical tool or model uh, to analyze geometric deep learning architectures um, that, to a certain extent, helps us unify the graph and manifold settings. On the other hand, it's, it's a useful representation unto itself. 
um, which we saw in some of those numerical experiments. And going beyond the usual graph Laplacian to say the magnetic Laplacian allows us to work with directed graphs. And one can think of this in many other settings as well, such as topological structures and stuff and other types of Laplacians. Anyway, that, that just leads into the fact that there's many, many, many different directions this can all go. So anyway, thank you very much for your time uh, and attention. <clears throat> Thanks, Matt, for this very interesting talk. Any questions so far? Question? Uh, Go ahead. So I was uh, thinking like the magnetic uh, approach that you showed here, like we can do node classification and also we can do the link prediction. So do you think that the work can be extended to perform the link classification also? Link classification, I mean, certainly in principle, yes. Um, the way we do the link, actually, I don't need this slide. Well, no, I can slide back to maybe this one. The way we do the link prediction is very um, simple. We just take the, the output representation of each vertex here. And then we subtract, you know, if I call this, if I call this row here, I don't know, phi of X for the representation of the vertex X at this stage, then if we want to represent the edge X, Y, we map it to phi of X minus phi of Y, which incidentally preserves directionality because it will flip the sign for an edge pointing the other direction. So, this works well for link prediction, but it could also work well for link classification, right? I mean, this is really just a generic way of representing links. Um, okay. okay. I mean, in principle, I mean, of okay. course, the subjects of training and all of that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>